record to the cloud. We're underway. You're good to go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Digital Rebar Provision Community Meetup number 19. Today is Tuesday, June 5th. I will not be on camera since I'm in a bandwidth constrained location, as is Greg today. And so uh, we've got no camera, and I'm not going to be driving any screen share. We're going to have Rob driving a uh, demo for us today. Uh, today we've got on tap, we've got a Kubernetes crib demo. We've done this before, but we've since uh, refreshed uh, some of the crib content, and we have some interesting conversations around uh, HA patterns. Uh, I don't think we'll be demoing the HA patterns today, but in the next uh, meetup or two, we can do that as well to demonstrate the HA patterns. And then we have a new piece of uh, content and uh, configuration components coming together for workflow to help with operating system network configurations. We're calling that, uh, what are we calling that now? Network Wrangler? Something like that. Network Wrangler. So today's uh, uh, naming is Network Wrangler. We'll talk a little bit about the some information around that, some design objectives. We're looking forward to any input from the community. A lot of this work has actually been driven from some of the customer requirements we've had, and this is sort of a direct reflection of our uh, design for our customers and for our community members with a lot of what we do. Um, on board from the Racken team, we have myself, Shane Gibson, we've got Rob Hirschfeld and uh, Greg Althaus, our founder, CEO, and CTO and one of our senior software engineers, Victor Lowther, and as always, our marketing dude, uh, Steven Spector's on board with us. We've got a great representation from community today, so everybody, thank you for participation. Uh, today, we're gonna start with, um, Rob, are you ready to kick off with the, the crib stuff, or do we wanna start with uh, Wrangler? I can, I can start with the crib stuff, that way you'll okay. have more integration, integrated demos to start with. Um, I'm trying to think of, uh, there's, a, there's some documentation I've been putting together. So um, we've, we've talked about crib before, um, and, and actually I'm, probably, I'm thinking to tweak the, the name to Kubernetes Rebar Integrated Boot, but um, crib is, is back sort of in the tension because we've been doing some work on it. Um, we've been, been having some discussions about how, how it works, and, and the simplicity of it, especially when you start comparing it to other efforts that we saw like at OpenStack where people showed off um, something called okay. Airship. Before um, you kick off on that, um, I also want to make note that at the end of the program, we always try to make room for community to ask questions, discussions, comments, et cetera, to that effect. So. Uh, we'll kick off with the crib demo. We'll do the discussion on Network Wrangler and then community. Uh, we're going to turn over the reins to Rob here uh, to go continue on with his crib information. Looking forward to it. Uh, I'm not sure I can. My uh, screen share is in this bandwidth is hosing my machine. I'll take I'll, I'll take over. Yeah. But you have to stop. I can't. <laughs> it's it's dead spinning. Dying oh, at that. I see what's I see what's going on. Uh, yeah. Steven, I need you to share. Let me see if I can if I can do it. Okay, let me let me see if I can force quit Zoom. There we go. Now you should be able to take it. I'm trying. Uh, let's see. Uh, it gave me the ability to steal the share if I wanted to. Yeah, you, can you give the Rob Hirschfeld PC um, rights? Okay, well now I'm... <laughs> Force reboot. Okay, now I'm, okay. now I'm sharing my screen. Yeah. So how do I share this now? No, just turn that off. Let me, okay. let me have... It's, it's, it won't let me while somebody else is sharing. You want me to come no, off? I have it now. We're all, okay. we're all there. Um, so I'm going to start this with a um, very unexciting uh, terminal, and then I'm going to switch into um, UX uh, for displays. 
um, which is a little bit backwards. So, so here's, here's what we're trying to accomplish with, with, with CRIB. We want to have the, the simplest, most minimal bare metal Kubernetes that you can do. So um, we, we, this is a rebar meetup, so we don't need to, to trumpet rebar particularly, but the idea is you want to be able to start machines and have Kubernetes show up. Um, and the less effort you have to put in beyond that, the better. Um, and then what we want to be able to do is have very uh, strong controls for you know, bringing up every component with physical servers, the operating systems, right, and BIOS, switches. Um, and then we want day two operations where we can patch, place, update machines. And so the, the rebar infrastructure provides all of the external control componentry necessary for Kubernetes to um, be built without needing anything ex else external. Uh, and I'm gonna walk through that process, uh, how we do it, how it works. But the idea here is Rebar does the boot provision, Pixie provision, um, automation, all of that, right? So the normal install, and then the workflow capabilities of digital Rebar allow us to actually use KubeADM, which is the Kubernetes, um, uh, the Kubernetes install process, to build a Kubernetes that can install Kubernetes. So you don't need Ansible, although we'll support Ansible playbooks. Um, you don't need Chef, Papa, Salt. It literally, there's enough with KubeADM and Rebar to build the full cluster and actually do it in a completely HA way. And we'll talk about what the HA plans are uh, towards the end of this. Um, and what I've, what I've done, just to keep things simple, is I've already built a Kubernetes cluster using Crib. Uh, and I'm going to show you at work, and then I'm going to reset it and start over. Um, so, which is a little bit backwards, but it's helpful not to have to wait for Kubernetes to finish installing to show you that it worked. Um, so what I've done is I've, I've, can you see my, yeah, you can see this. Um, I've, I've initialized a digital rebar endpoint in my uh, system so I can say DRP. And we have, I think there's some chatter. If you're not talking, please mute. So there's a DRP CLI machines list. Um, so I, I, I just have a, Kuben, uh, a system already running. And one of the things that we've done is I've run crib in it. Um, and I've built a uh, DRP CLI profile. So if I, this, in this case, this is, you can do multiple clusters out of the same digital rebar provision. In this case, I have one called k Live Demo. k Live Demo has a whole bunch of data in it because we've run Kubernetes. I'll show this on the UX where it's easier to read. But what I can literally do is take that command and clear it out so you can see it again. So inside of that profile, I have three machines in that profile. There's a parameter called cluster admin config. I can take that value, which is generated by kube admin, toss it into a file, so if I cat admin conf, this is the, um, config, all the configuration information necessary for, to attach to a Kubernetes cluster and run it. So it has some certificate data, so I don't need user admin, I'm not, not using passwords, I've got a certificate, I've got the address. So now what I can do is with that file, I can do a kube cuddle command, let me do it, here, um, a kube cuddle command where I'm literally saying, hey, use kube cuddle and attach to this config file and then get the nodes. So without having any direct access to this cluster, I'm actually able to attach using this configuration file. So the, the fun thing about this that I'm about to show building is I don't need any additional information. I literally just pick nodes, put them in this profile, and then it's gonna eject this admin comp file that I can use to control the, the system, which includes, um, I can use that same file with, in proxy mode. Now I'm gonna switch my browser to, you, to show you the you know, browser screen. This one. Okay. This is the, so the, we have a dedicated documentation documentation page about what I'm showing you. So you can look at this and see videos and things like that. 
Um, the proxy pack command I just gave literally attaches to the endpoint through proxy. So my local machine is now a proxy gateway to the to Kubernetes cluster. Um, and so this is running, uh, it was actually letting me navigate and look. I don't think this installed the UX, the Kubernetes UI, so um, I can't just, I can't bring up the UI to show you. Uh, and so, so that's basically the output of the system. It's worth showing it so that you understand just how easy we're trying to make Kubernetes. It's those two commands and you're using the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and the docs actually show you how to do this without using the UX. Um, what we do for a crib demo is we start with nodes and then we put them in a workflow. The workflow is going to install the operating system, install Docker, um, and then it's going to elect a master and then rub, run kubeadmin init on that master. Uh, two meetups ago, we actually showed some cluster um, logic. Where it, it, this, that was actually based on this, this pattern. So all the other nodes come up and they hold until the master's elected. It initializes, it, it creates a cluster token. And then once that cluster token is um, generated, all of the other nodes are released. So you can skip that step altogether if you want. So if you have a system that, that already has a master or you're using a third party vendor who generates a cluster for you, you can just start this system using kubeadm join with the tokens. So I'm gonna, I'll show you that a little bit. And then, so as you go forward in the future, literally you can just use the, the join side of this logic. And this also works if you're resetting the nodes. So one of the patterns we use is an immutable boot. You literally could reboot the machine and when it reinstalls, put it back through the workflow and rejoin. So what we're really working for here is zero touch clusters, with no additional piece. There's enough inside of Rebar plus KubeADM and the community pieces of Kubernetes to actually build the full infrastructure. So, Rebar. I'll pause. I, I'm not monitoring the back channel for, for questions. But. Okay, so here's here's what we have in the Rebar hold, infrastructure. Hold on, hold on, Rob. Um, I, sorry, I was muted. Um, so one of the things I wanted to know is you, you mentioned that the um, tooling also does the Docker and the Kubernetes install. Um, if you have machines prepared, i.e. an image deploy machine with Kubernetes and uh, Docker installed already, then this pattern can apply without doing all the install steps. So it can make bring up even quicker. And then, of course, a follow on to that is the live in memory boot. Uh, instance, if it contains Docker and Kubernetes as well, you can do the live boot uh, uh, in memory RAM boot um, method uh, with without doing the uh, uh, package installs as well. And we have some content that's uh, not quite ready yet, but is oriented towards doing all of that along with um, providing customized live boot images. Um, so those are interesting pieces as well I wanted to make note of. Yeah, the, 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 live, the, the live boot images that Shane's been working on include those prereqs, so you don't have the download Docker install problem. You know, there's a lot of things we can take care of. Um, we'll, we'll get there in a minute. Uh, this, is, this is that profile that I was talking about. So here's the case live demo. Um, this is the file that I pulled down using the CLI. And then uh, what you'll see in here is this is the actual join command. So if you think about the, the workflow, if the cluster join command is present, then it will use that command to join the node. So if you, if you know this information or you can extract it from another system, um, we were talking to somebody who, who said, oh yeah, if you, you know, provide these, these parameters, then we'll, we'll be able to, nodes will join our cluster. This is exactly the format. It's just using this, this command. And then uh, the cluster master was elected. Um, in this case, I could specify it using, or just I could put in the UUID of the machine that I want to be the master. The one required thing to start with is this K8 slide demo. So the clustering pattern that Digital Rebar uses means that the name of the cluster is in the, is in the profile. It has to do with the way digital rebar profiles show up and parameters are shaped. So that's the one required thing. So to do a reset of the system, I'm going to remove 
all of these generated pieces except cluster profile. Uh, let's see, I'll save that. Let me make sure that it's right. Okay, so these are those are now only this one here. Here's some uh, older V2 legacy stuff. I'm going to ignore it. If I come over to my machines list, um, oh, good. You, and we've actually reset. There's some icons that get updated as we go. Shane, I'm going to put these back through a full discovery uh, workflow. You can do whatever you want. Awesome. Um, so in this case, uh, Sledgehammer's running. I should be able to just hit reset in this case, and the system is going to identify that um, there's a new workflow going and reboot the nodes. So in back end, this is back ended in packet. And so the system at this point, that one, that one button, this is a very powerful button if you don't, if you don't, if you, if you don't want to click it. Um, what it's going to do is it sets machines back into whatever the default um, workflow is. And that, if it's a different operating system, is going to trigger um, a reset. Um, I, Shane, I, I'm not sure that actually is going to trigger a reset because I think it's still in Sledgehammer. Yeah, well, could, yeah, so just go ahead and give it a kick. Uh, the, the actions power cycle. Yep. Okay, so that's going to reboot. I'll show you what the workflow looks like while we wait for the reboot. Uh, let me monitor to see if when they come back online. Okay. Um, so in this case, uh, the, I'm making them less jumbled up. So here is the K8's live cluster. So uh, this workflow is pretty straightforward. It stays in Sledgehammer. So it's doing an immutable boot. It gives me SSH access. It mounts the local disks, installs Docker. It's going to run the crib install steps. I'll show you those. And then it's just going to go into a wait. If I wanted to install it to actual disks, Shane's built this uh, case install cluster, which does a CentOS install, installs the runner, waits for it to finish. And then it does the same steps, installs Docker, and does the crib install. Notice it doesn't do a mount disks because this is actually running on the disk um, from that perspective. And so it's a pretty straightforward mapping um, from that perspective of how this, how this is going to work. Um, and we're still waiting for the machines to recover from the reboot. So in this case, we're just waiting for those type zeros to reboot through packet. Once they check in, we're going to get that additional, additional workflow. Um, and I'll show you how the profiles go. Um, but the thing that's fun here is that no additional, uh, so this is going to go right into the discover workflow. I could actually put it into the um, install workflow if I wanted. But I'm not going to. I'll do this in two steps. Um, so you can see the machines literally have rebooted. Now they're back into that workflow. If I put them back into that uh, live boot workflow, they would have actually gone straight through the process of doing the, the install. It's not how we test, so I, I didn't do it that way. Now, if I go into the K8's live cluster, um, what you'll see, and notice it reset the icons. So I'm gonna say start the workflow here, and that's gonna go through this process of, of doing the workflow. So mounting local disks, we're gonna do the Docker install, uh, all those processes. If I jump into, and notice we're actually, there's some niceties here. It's changing the icons so we can get some broader level um, install tips. If I jump over to the profiles and find the K8s, my K8s cluster, what's going to happen in this view is it, once it reaches the install, it will do the, the master election and you'll see the master key show up here. So it's going to randomly select whichever one is first. It's going to select that um, and then continue through the process. Um, what, we're, what we're doing behind the, cup, by, behind the scenes is the CLI lot, has a, a method where you can check to see if an object has changed or not. There's a reference object uh, option. And that allows us to have multiple systems, multiple independent systems making, trying to make the same changes via the CLI. The UX has a similar mechanism using patch. And 
uh, that allows us to have a uh, safe election of a, of a vendor of a single node. Let me see. Maybe I'm not updating my. Nope, it just isn't there yet. Oh, sorry, Docker is, is super slow. I always lose patience. So one of the one of the reasons why it's beneficial to uh, include Docker in the immutable image that you're booting is because Docker is pretty slow to download and install. And so by skipping that step, um, you literally can save um, five minutes from an install time instead of waiting on Docker to get installed in the system. Um, so while we wait for this, I'm going to like watch in the background. Actually, so, um, Greg, I don't know if you are able to talk. Uh, I was going to do the HA stuff. So yeah, Greg. Yeah, yeah. The perfect is exactly same wavelength there. Go, Greg. Yeah. So, so I'm here. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, so we've been looking at. Uh, up leveling this and trying to take advantage of HA and our ability to control and sync with snows through workflows. And the election process that Rob was mentioning can also then be used to um, expand out and choose like which node should be in an etcd cluster. And instead of just electing one, we can actually build a pool of them. And then in the case of Kubernetes masters, we can actually choose one to be the primary master to do the initial setup pieces and then do um, additional masters after that first one's come up because what we've started to implement and should have out soon is an HA version of Kubernetes based upon some of the community documentation around using Kubeatom and setting up uh, primary IPs and VIP failovers and load balancers um, for on-premise HA Kubernetes so that the system will let you either specify a pool of masters by UUID up front, or um, it will build the first N that show up. And then you have some options around choosing things like how many etcd servers do you want? How many Kubernetes masters do you want? Do you want them to be on the same systems? And, and let that drive through the system and then add the appropriate worker nodes after that and all sequenced and controlled using the same kind of profile of mutable um, atomic kind of based operations that our API normally gives you. So that's there. In conjunction to that, the system will also pick up the ability to manage certificates and let you do things like create trusted etcd clusters with their own certificate sets so that you don't have a single master certificate and stuff like that. And through a plugin, you'll be able to manage those certs. And while I haven't implemented it yet, you could even start envisioning cert rotations and other security practices that you would want to do um, for a long running kind of production security kind of environment as well. So those are some of the things that we're coming up with um, that'll be extensions to kind of what Rob's showing you. Oh. One more thing, and it'll transition from a content pack to a plugin. Um, the, this allows us to add some of like the certificate signing and some of the other, other stuff in so that those become um, actions on the nodes so that you can do things like, give me a certificate for this root CA. And that way the, the signing authority doesn't have to give the node any credentials and the node can keep its private key and that doesn't get shared. So adds a whole nother layer of proper security practices for passing out and, and doing your, your certificates for your secure communication paths. And, and interestingly, <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate that. Uh, every, everybody, Greg's on vacation today. So it was very nice of him to step in and join us and talk about the HA pieces. One of the other things that we talked about, um, I don't remember if it was last meetup or the previous one, but we have a new pattern that is, has been implemented, which is uh, secure parameters. So parameters can be defined to and specified as secure 
and they're encrypted in the configuration. So at some point, we may see some of those sorts of patterns applying to some of the sensitive information, uh, maybe around the certificates or some of the crib uh, join information, et cetera, that we can actually obfuscate and encrypt in the configuration uh, to help in, in increase that security posture as well. Um, so there was one, one thing that's worth, worth noting additionally from, from that, because there's just trying to get interlocking uh, features where we can keep adding more and more pieces. The certificate um, plugin is, could be used, actually I'll ask it, Greg, could the certificate plugin piece be used outside of the Kubernetes demo? Yeah, in fact, the way the system is implemented, though they're tied closely together, they're in currently in the same kind of content bundle uh, plugin piece, is that the etcd cluster actually is built completely independently from the HA cluster for, uh, for Kubernetes master and minion setups. So you're actually building a Kubernetes cluster, a secure multi-node etcd cluster, and then you're pointing Kubernetes at that. It just so happens they run by default on top of the, or underneath the master node. So all that's available. Um, and so that uses the search system. Um, and then other things can use the search systems as well. So in fact, the etcd is set up to do um, kind of the highest level of security that you can set up for etcd, which is all three of the communication paths have different cert routes so that you can rotate search between the etcd peers, between what the clients see the servers as and what the servers see the clients as. So you can tweak all those systems. It was kind of an experimentation to make sure that you could set up all kind of those layers. So it's an example of generating multiple cert routes um, and then driving the signing in the appropriate directions. So clients can create their search that then the servers will identify and then vice versa. If, if, you, if people have been following Digital Rebar since the V2 days, this was functionality we built in a little bit more clumsy way in version two. Um, and then Greg was able to forward rebuild. It's really a complete rebuild, but the same idea of having a service that provides certificates that you can call as a function. Um, and that's, that's generic functionality because we see a lot of applications for being able to manage uh, private key generation, um, sorry, uh, private certificate generation and distribution. That's okay. a good thing to know. Sorry, that's a good thing to know real quick. Is right now it's all of a self-signed case and it's intended, it's intended purpose is to secure kind of your internal uh, service communications. Um, it would not be too hard to expand that to um, intermediate signing and things like that. Needed to be. Right. So, so for, for example, if you had uh, known names on the machines, could we then, I guess, integrate into a let's encrypt process or something and generate uh, signed keys with a, with yeah. a trust? So that would be a path. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's a, a path. I was thinking more also of if you actually generated your own or had your own signing certificate that you wanted to use that you had already done for passing around certs, we could potentially set up that plugin to do an intermediate signing so that you could not have your true valuable cert out there in the signing places, but then still have an intermediate level that could handle the, the real signing, but that would be um, authorized to sign, but revocable and then that could then be used as your kind of distributed, but then it doesn't look like it's a self-signed certificate. Wow. Okay. But, right. so it's, but yeah. that's a but that's a longer term story, right? I mean, it's we don't well, we're not doing that. You know, now, we're, a lot of these deployments rely on self-signed certs, which aren't particularly a you know the browsers are starting to reject that, and that becomes a problem. Uh, this this allows you to to have a, a higher level of security and potentially inject a, a real certificate system um, behind a cluster as you build it. Go ahead, Shane, sorry. Uh, no, I was just gonna say uh, with the Let's Encrypt process, you have to remember that Let's Encrypt certs will only work with uh, host 
fully qualified host names that resolve correctly. So there's uh, DNS integration stuff that would need to be done in preparation for Let's Encrypt to work because they don't sign certs for IP address. Right, and that's that's a significant thing to note, right? You can't really do certs well without a DNS infrastructure, without a resolvable DNS infrastructure. And this, this the way we're, we're building it uh, gets around that to an extent by generating a, a shared trust. An internal internal uh, signature. I'm not saying I'm not using the right word. Right, and Victor's laughing. At me. So, and and the only reason it didn't show, by the way, to finish the demo, uh, I was looking at the wrong profile, which probably half of you on the call were like, "Rob, that's not the right profile." Uh, this is this is the. Um, oops, I need to be in the K8's live demo. Profile and then it just regenerated all the, the bits and pieces. So. Okay, and so are you do you have more you're going to show us there, Rob? Or you? No, I, I would entertain I would entertain questions if people have them. Uh, I'm going to reset reset and rerun. Um, okay. Just because it's fun, and let that run in the background. Um, I guess you want to take you want to go back to the agenda, or do you want me to just run this in the background as a reset on the demo? Uh, well, if you're going to restart the demo, it's going to take a little while longer so to, to kick over. So let's go ahead and move forward. And Victor, um, let's talk a little bit about Wrangler. Look, you've uh, been hard at work the last, what, week or so on? Um, yes, and I prefer to call it Net Mangler, but I think I've been overridden by both our CEO and our chief marketing officer. So, uh, okay. Yes. You were Wrangler yes. into changing. Yeah, although I'd rather not call it Wrangler because that's an internal thing you can publish the name of. Yep, we haven't done a trademark search yet. <laughs> uh, so, so, so let's yeah. talk a little bit at first about, I mean, what the goals are for it and why it kind of came about, uh, generically speaking, and then uh, what we're trying to accomplish with it and where we're at with it. Yeah, so... Back in the day, in the original Crowbar and in Digital Rebar version two, um, we had a rather complex subsystem that was dedicated solely to managing IP addresses and uh, defining and creating network interfaces that be needed for whatever scenario you wanted to run. Um, and that was great, but uh, turns out that uh, a lot of our customers didn't really care to use it. And it was uh, fairly over-engineered for the cases where uh, it did come in handy. Um, we, we spent a lot of time mapping out uh, hard, or interface uh, name uh, abstractions to cover the fact that interfaces uh, didn't used to be able to be enumerated uh, in a safe way on Linux environments. You know, your interface name could change from reboot to reboot if you updated the wrong set of things and a whole bunch of other stuff along those lines. Um, however, we now have a couple of customers that uh, do need to do uh, more network configuration besides uh, keep using the interface that you originally Pixie booted off of and DHCP it. And so we need a utility that can, um, that we can use to feed network configuration information into uh, a system either as a uh, post OS install step, like so during the OS install process, but at the point in which it's running post install scripts, or as part of uh, laying down an image um, after, you, at, after the system has laid down the image, but before it's rebooted into the final thing, we need a tool that will be able to take a, a template of choice and some parameters of choice and uh, turn those into a network config that um, may be fairly complex with VLANs and bonds and bridges in various different uh, physical interfaces. <clears throat> and so that's what uh, NetWrangler TM is going to implement. Um, the initial design um, or the MVP for the tool and uh, what I've been working towards is to be able to parse, parse the bits of the uh, NetPlan specification. Uh, that's the uh, new thing that uh, Canonical came up with for specifying network interfaces. Um, to take a single file in uh, that format 
and spit out all the system D uh, networking uh, files that you need to uh, instantiate the network layout that uh, you got from that YAML. And so that's going to cover, uh, that's going to be our MVP to cover uh, current Ubuntu's and CentOS's where you can uh, get rid of the old school uh, Etsy network interfaces or Etsy sysconfig network interfaces stuff and uh, enable system D network D and then you will be able to uh, feed a uh, feed a template expanded uh, YAML file into NetMangler and it will spit out all of the right system D stuff to uh, implement the network configuration that you want on the system. Um, this takes advantage of uh, improvements in the Linux community since we wrote the, uh, or the Linux networking community since we wrote the initial um, implementation of Crowbar in that there are two It has only been a couple of years. Yeah, like eight. Uh, in that uh, UDEV and System D now know how to enumerate, uh, to enumerate and rename network interfaces in a stable fashion based off of the bus address of the mm -hmm. interface. So we can rely on systems that have System D to be able to uh, give us interfaces that are named in the same way, whether or not, uh, and, uh, and uh, the fact that system D network D is finally unifying the network configuration language that you can use across uh, multiple different distros. You can go in and uh, as long as you have system D network D available on the box, which you should for any distro released in the last three and a half years, you can go in and uh, disable whatever they're, they're using by default, which is usually a network manager or their old script-driven network interface configuration. Switch over to system D network D and uh, you know, populate the uh, system D network D's uh, configuration directory with uh, a bunch of files that uh, collectively define how networking should work on the box. And so that's what we're gonna target initially. Um, the next steps after that are going to probably be uh, targeting, uh, targeting uh, Windows in that, uh, you know, Windows doesn't know or care about any of this crazy system stuff. And uh, it has its own unique way of configuring network interfaces. And for imaging purposes, that's probably going to be in the form of uh, either outputting um, a structured JSON file that you can mangle appropriately with a custom written uh, PowerShell script. Or if I get enough uh, input from the community and or feel sufficiently ambitious, have it spit off the PowerShell script that you would need to run directly. Um, but that is more of a stretch goal because I do not consider myself to be a, an expert on how to configure Windows networking in PowerShell by any stretch of the imagination. Although I know that uh, you can do basically anything you can do in Linux, you can do on in uh, Windows to some degree or another with respect to bonds and bridges and VLANs. So I have a series of questions, but I'll pause to let other people ask questions first. By the way, the, de the demo's finished on the other on the flip side. So. That it takes awesome. exactly as long as a Victor explanation of network. <laughs> oh, I'm going to start I'm gonna start scratching the surface. <laughs> that's our, it can get a lot hairier than that. As anyone who's tried to muck about with this stuff knows. Yes, any questions so far? Oh, let's see. Community? Community, Chris, I'm watching for your uh, chat. Oh, let's see. We've got, this is on the previous ones. Uh, G, uh, GN. GNS3 network device simulations, yeah. Never heard of it. Nope, we don't. I've heard of it. I've looked at it, but we haven't done much with it. Yeah, usually when I want to do this, I just uh, spin up a sacrificial VM and start going crazy with the uh, IP calls and whatnot until I figure out uh, what the default, what topologies are allowed and uh, what I can and can't verify statically before I actually write and config files. And that's actually been the bulk of uh, what I've done is to make sure to have a, a good intermediate uh, data model and uh, very good sanity checking um, to make sure that I'm not going to write out something that's insane and that I can reject insane configurations very early, at least obviously insane ones. Uh, ATA for the release of the networking configuration feature. Um, the initial one, Depending on how much I get sidetracked over other stuff, it will probably be anywhere from the next uh, three days to a couple of weeks. Um, it mostly matters how much velocity I can manage to devote to it. Um, and that's just uh, making sure that when I release something, it's not going to obviously explode in your face when uh, that's something that is uh, 
Incorrect. And, and, and this is plugins. It's not, this isn't core rebar features. This is extension features. Right? Um, my first pass implementation is as a complete standalone binary that you feed, you feed it in a YAML in a certain format and it's takes, and it, uh, you give it a parameter that says what kind of output you want. It's going to spit out that kind of output. Um, depending on what output it is, it'll either put it in a directory or spit it on standard out or write it to a file or whatever the format so, is. So for people who, this is exactly how, and, uh, this is exactly how Go High for, Surface originally. Yeah. Which and so for digital rebar, that'll probably wind up being bundled into a plugin whose main purpose is, is to provide some uh, example templates and uh, a set of uh, parameters. Or controlling, uh, you know, IP addresses to assigned interfaces, uh, name servers, routing information, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We we could probably bundle it with the LLDP uh, content that we have. Logical. They're uh, different. So they, 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 they system B can do some LLDP stuff, but it, it, it's it's too early to tell how exactly we're going to bundle that together if we're going to bundle it together. Um, and, I want to wait until I get a working tool and can show it off to people first. Is, is it dependent on 3.9 release or is it separate from 3.9 release? Uh, it'd be independent of 3.9. Uh, from a function standpoint, I mean, uh, the initial delivery mechanism would be as a plugin that provides a content layer with example content. And so I'm not going to target it to this so that you must have a specific right. version. Right. And there's, but there's nothing in 3.9 that's that there's no APIs no. or capabilities that are 3.9 specific for this, for how this works. No, the initial status is going to be like the uh, tools that I wrote to do uh, bias and rate mangling. Um, there are there is some stuff that I provide as content layers, and then there's a couple of standalone binaries that uh, take the output of those content layers and turn them into whatever bizarre combination of mega CLI commands or on config and on report commands are needed to do what needs to happen. So. 3.9 has a lot of cap lot of new stuff coming in it. Um, that's probably its, its own topic. Um, so it's good that these aren't these aren't coupled. If you're not, if there's not going to be a forced 3.9 upgrade to try this out. Um, yeah, but uh, once I get the enough functionality so that it's spitting out vaguely sane looking system D stuff, I'll probably release it to uh, internal internal uh, partners and customers that have been uh, looking for it. So, so, so I, I'm. I'll pause for questions. I was going to recap this because I've been I've been working to ex try and explain it in very simple terms what this is and why it's important. Um, so it's I like Victor's explanation, but I, I try to do one that's for just mere mortals, and then I go from there. Um, so interrupt if you have questions. I'm, I'm stalling a little bit to see if there's questions. Otherwise, I'm going to recap um, and try and try and explain this. So there's, there's a specific set of problems uh, that we're trying to address with this, with this uh, mangler, wrangler. Um, and what that is, is that when we're provisioning machines, we want their networking topologies to be different than what they might just be from a normal net boot. And so traditionally, the way people tried to solve this problem is by modifying the kickstarts or precedes or adding some post configuration scripts uh, like we did it in the chef cookbook that got world incredibly chef. complex. And because of the way those things operate, they were very sensitive to losing network connectivity. Um, and thus this was like the, the change of doom if you, if you got anything wrong. So what, what we're working on here is a way to write networking configurations, configuration driven network setup. So you can turn on different networking Apologies and configurations um, based on what the machine has. So you could take some inventory and then you could set it up. Or you could just inject your target networking configuration um, and have, and then run this command and have it actually implement the networking changes. It, it's relying on configuration files being generated and put in place, which works in a regular boot environment. I boot and then I run. And we're also making sure that it runs as a pre-boot configuration step if you're doing image-based deployments. So part of the big interest here is not just that we can set networking as, instead of doing it in a Kickstarter or pre-seed, but that we can actually lay down an image and then mess with the image in a way that sets up the networking in the final state so that when you boot into that image, 
uh, you have networking the way you want it without having to then do any post configuration. So yeah. it's like, for example, in the Windows case, the goal there would be to uh, write out either a PowerShell script or a blob of JSON that can be interpreted by a PowerShell script that winds up getting run as part of sysprep whenever you're coming back, when you're doing the first move from uh, laying the image down. And uh, that's a little trickier because it's not really my uh, area of expertise there. But on the Linux side, you know, it's just a matter of uh, laying down the right system, D, network D, config files, or if I you know, get enough uh, push from the community or patches from the community, you know, either making the changes on, on the fly with uh, the IP command, tool, the command set or you know, writing out other network configuration files. And, and so we're getting some good uh, questions. All right, so Greg is answering them online, right? This, this, is, this is like layer one, layer two networking changes, right? It's not getting any higher into uh, the initial stuff. Uh, my initial goal is for it to be able to configure physical interfaces, Ethernet, uh, or if you have a lot of money to spend, you know, InfiniBand or Rynet or whatever. Okay. Um, and then to handle uh, doing uh, bonding, bridging, and uh, straight up tag VLAN interfaces on top of those so in, uh, in any same two. combination. So yeah, layer one and layer two, it's not intended to do any crazy tunneling stuff or any, uh, or for now, any VXLAN stuff because uh, each one of those you add kind of uh, makes the complexity of the tool go up exponentially in terms <laughs> of checking for sanity. And a lot of what we're trying to do is say, we know there's other NICs on the system. How do you set them up? How do you configure them, right? How do you, you know, it's all of that work that we would, you have, we have to do it to enable those other NICs. Um, it's, you know, somebody, somebody has to do it somewhere. Yeah, the, and uh, without this, you know, the current usage pattern in uh, digital rebar provision is, uh, well, we'll try to make sure that the NIC that we uh, initially pixie booted from gets configured, but for everything else, you know, have at it, have fun writing scripts and do that. And part of this is to try to standardize that pile of scripts that people would inevitably wind up writing. And, and Greg's answering questions in the chat um, about, right, this, is, this isn't an IPAM tool. Um, you could see this progressing to a place where it integrates with IPAM, so it's injecting the IPs on the machines that you want. Um, data, injecting like IPs, um, the current tool will kind of rely on template expansion to have uh, written out a uh, YAML file that has whatever IPs you need uh, inserted into it. Um, and I'll, you know, we'll elaborate on that functionality more based on, you know, customer feedback and consulting. So, so it's mapping, it's, it's mapping the physical, physical networking and setting all the files that you need to set. Yeah. Which has gotten significantly easier over the last eight years as System B has eaten the Linux universe. <laughs> awesome. So, Victor, thank you very much for all of that information. We've got a little bit about about seven or eight minutes left. Um, is there anything you want to wrap up with the uh, network mangler wrangler wizard thing? Thing, and then uh, if not, then we'll uh, move over to community discussion to close out the rest of the meeting. Um, right, and we're, we're hoping for the next meetup or the one after that to actually have a demo of the systems working. Yeah, I mean, it, how much uh, gets done basically boils down to how much velocity do I have when not dealing with other things. So, so community, help each other. <laughs> Save time for Victor. Awesome. Uh, very exciting information. Looking forward to it. A lot of great feedback from community on that. Uh, with that, let's transition over to community. Do we have any general questions about things in general, uh, where we're at, things that you're stuck on, problems, uh, anything? It's your, your floor to all of our community members. We, uh, we talked everybody out with the excitement over the mangler. <laughs> All right, uh, Rob, did you have any more uh, wrap up on uh, what you were demoing earlier or? Uh, you know, we're always looking for, for people to come in and try and, and give us feedback about what they're seeing. This was, I wanted to do this as a refresher because, um, you know, in a couple of weeks we'll have, um, we'll, we'll talk about the HA version and, and how things are going. So this, is, this sets the stage for that because obviously there's 20 minutes of demos before we even talked about the HA stuff, so. Awesome. 
All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. That wraps up uh, version 19 of the community meetup. We'll see you in two weeks here, and hopefully we'll have some uh, demonstration from Mangler and uh, Crib HA stuff by then and some discussions on uh, version 3.9.0 release. Until then, uh, provision on. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone.